Welcome to Around Kansas. I'm Deb Goodrich. And I'm Michelle Martin. So if it's Monday, it must be Discovering History with Deb and Michelle. And we have so much history to share with you today that we better jump right in. We're going to be talking about the G.A.R., the Grand Army of the Republic. The um, image right behind me is perfect for talking about that because this is from Fort Leavenworth. This is from the Leavenworth Lamp, the Post newspaper there at Fort Leavenworth. And Fort Leavenworth, of course, is the oldest continuously operated post west of the Mississippi River. And as I always find a way to do, I've connected my image to Fort Scott, my adopted Kansas hometown. And this is actually a postcard from the headquarters of the Department of Kansas for the Fort Scott GAR post. And it actually denotes that dues for the quarter were received from a specific member. And these are great finds you can snag on eBay or other places to add to your historical collection. That's pretty cool. And like Michelle said, so many GAR posts scattered across the state of Kansas. Um, everybody had one, um, but they were not distinctive just to Kansas. They were all over the nation. The GAR was one of the first lobbying organizations in the nation, had a huge membership. And of course, this, the Grand Army of the Republic, refers to the Union veterans of the Civil War. The Confederates had their own organization to mirror that. But the Grand Army was an extremely powerful political lobby in the second half of the 19th century. And you know, Deb, Kansas earns its a nickname after the war, the soldier state, primarily because we see more uh, members of GAR posts moving from other parts of the country to Kansas after the war than any other state in the nation. And you know those men are coming west partially to take advantage of the Homestead Act. Thank you, be, President Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And of course, we have we would be remiss if we didn't, you know, note that, of course, with that movement of more individuals westward seeking land, that does mean that we have yet another round of American Indian removal that takes place. Right. Um, so as we see people moving uh, west, there's always going to be that movement of Native people, unfortunately. But Kansas in particular becomes known as the soldier state for all of these men who leave uh, their homes and come to settle in Kansas. You know, the other thing about veterans in Kansas, you know, we, had, we were a new state. We had a really small population. But per capita, we had the highest number of men serving in the Union Army than any other state. So we are doubly blessed with veterans after the Civil War is over. That's, that's right, Deb. And it's not, and we need to make sure that our viewers, that all you folks understand one thing that's really amazing about the GAR, they had posts for white soldiers, but they also had special GAR posts for African American veterans. And of course, Kansas led the way in the, uh, for the nation during the Civil War. We have the first and second Kansas colored infantry uh, that are connected to uh, Fort Scott that serve in the war. As a matter of fact, they're the first African-American soldiers to see combat at the Battle of Island Mound. They are first. Uh, right, the, but the movie Glory would lead you to that's believe right. it that's was that. not the 54th Massachusetts. Yes. So, you know, Deb and I, we will fall on that sword. Yes, we, will. we sent our, our, you know, our African-American soldiers went to fight first. And so we see African-American GAR posts as well. And those become important social and political organizations for African-American men looking to make inroads into Kansas politics and society. Even the, um, the post made up of white veterans, as a rule, the GAR nationally lobbied for voting rights for black veterans. So it was a hugely important organization and really looking forward, they tended to be Republican at the time, which was the, 
the progressive party, the, the more, um, um, the party for change and equality, mm -hmm. I, I guess you might characterize it. So they tended to support Republican candidates at the time. One of those really important um, people was President Taft. And when the GAR Memorial Hall was begun in Topeka in 1911, I believe, um, President Taft came and laid the cornerstone for Memorial Hall. So that's only a block from the Capitol. And if you go to Topeka now, the Secretary of State and I think the Attorney General offices are there. But when I moved to Kansas, it was the Kansas Historical Society. And it was a real treat to research in, in that wonderful old building. But it was a hugely, hugely important um, Memorial, you know, that was, a, that was an incredible building at the time. Um, you know, it was very expensive, it was very elaborate, but that just goes to show you the power of the GAR and the patriotism of the GAR. Yes, and another expression of that patriotism is um, take a walk through any Kansas cemetery from those that are in crowded cities and metropolitan areas to places in far western Kansas and small little cemeteries on the windswept prairie and you will find the bronze uh, GAR markers on the graves of those veterans and so they begin the process of ensuring that the veterans of the war when they pass on that they are denoted and given those special rights and honors when they are buried in addition to military honors there were special gar honors mm -hmm. so you can go through any cemetery and find those gar markers so if you've never known what they were those round bronze markers that stand upright that say gar that denotes that individual served in the american civil war and so now you know what those are when you are taking a little walk through the cemetery. I got to tell you, Michelle, I was in um, Canal Dover or Dover, Ohio now and visiting the grave of William Clark Quantrell, noted guerrilla from mm -hmm. Missouri. And there was a GAR marker on his grave. So I don't know who was passing them out, but they must have just said, you know, he was a veteran and they just of the Civil War and they just assumed he got a GAR marker. Boy. So I don't know who was spinning faster, him or the soldiers in the cemetery who were buried with him. But no kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I actually did let them know that that was not appropriate. Unless, of course, unless, of course, the person who put that there knew and understood their history and did that as the ultimate prank to think. you know that ultimate final prank against William Clark Quantrill you never I, know. I don't think so I, I don't think so I don't think they would have uh, um, put their veterans in the same category so wow um, but yeah you know history does get muddled sometimes that's why we're here for you people <laughs> to unmuddle the history exactly well you know Deb um, what I find fascinating about the GAR and our good friend Arnold Schofield, who was the former chief historian at Fort Scott National Historic Site, and who was also the uh, site director at the Mine Creek Battlefield State Historic Site. Um, Arnold has spent a great deal of time studying the reach of the GAR in Kansas. And it's amazing, uh, as he began to research and start compiling material, uh, the towns that had GAR posts and sometimes communities had more than one. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Scott had two, uh, one that was for white soldiers, one that was for African-American soldiers. Little small Bronson, Kansas in Bourbon County had its own. Lynn, uh, there were posts in Lynn County. Um, I don't think there's anywhere you could go in Kansas where there was not a GAR post. And it really was a way for those men, those meetings were a way for those men to come together with their brothers, with their comrades in arms. They had experienced the same kinds of things during war. They had shared experiences that allowed them to connect with one another. They could talk about those things with their fellow soldiers and GAR, GAR post members that they could not share with their families. 
I think our modern equivalent would be um, our Korean and World War II and Vietnam veterans who go to the VFW right. or, the foreign, or the American Foreign Legion. Mm -hmm. um, they go and have that com camaraderie with one another. Um, even our Gulf War veterans, our, our veterans from Afghanistan, those organizations uh, have that same kind of purpose that the GAR did. And so I think the GAR is so important to understanding the social fabric in our Kansas communities in the 19th century. There was, a, a, of course, one or two posts and maybe more in Topeka, but one of the posts in Topeka actually had um, a Confederate attending. I don't know if he belonged, I kind of think he did, but um, Spivey, Mr. Spivey is buried in Topeka Cemetery with the, the pointy marker that Confederate uh, veterans get right in front of the GAO plot at Topeka Cemetery. And he was welcomed as a, a fellow, fellow brother at arms. So yeah, really, really interesting story. And uh, one I keep meaning to, I find something every now and then and I keep meaning to look at it. Um, Charles Curtis's dad belonged to the GAR post in Topeka. Um, he was not, uh, it's funny because um, for reasons we don't have time to go into, um, he actually was court-martialed at the end of his service, but nonetheless, they accepted him into the GAR post. So um, uh, very, very interesting, interesting organization. Definitely. And I think, um, and for me, having lived in Fort Scott, which has the second oldest, it would have it had the second oldest military post. It was established in the 1840s, um, now a unit of the National Park Service. That sense of history is in everything in Fort Scott. And at Fort Scott National Historic Site, we've had the opportunity as living history interpreters to share that GAR story with our visitors. And along with our good friend, uh, Greg Higginbotham, and our good friend, uh, John Mackey, and our dear friend, Barry Lindiff, um, at Fort Scott, we uh, did a really great vignette one year for Civil War weekend. And it was uh, veterans who were members of the Fort Scott GAR post who had gotten together and were um, imbibing and reliving the past. And I was uh, the I was the lone woman, and I was the little pen, I was the pension bride, as some of the young women were called. Uh, but uh, I sat while the men regaled the visitors with their stories of combat and of war, and what life was like for them after. And so it's interesting for our visitors to learn. Um, what life was like for those men after the war and the role that the GAR played in bringing them together and giving them a place where they felt comfortable and kind of had a home uh, with their fellow brethren in arms. So we really enjoyed uh, sharing that part of the history with our visitors at Fort Scott. Uh, that's a, a, a great thing that Fort Scott has always done with the uh, living history. It's always been so well done. Hey, let's take a break and we'll be right back. Howdy, I'm Seth Hayes and welcome to my hometown from then to now. Council Grove has a rich history as deep as the prairie tall grass. Spend the day visiting 25 historic sites or explore the unique shops and restaurants or mosey out of town along the Santa Fe Trail. You all visit my hometown, Council Grove, in the heart of the Flint Hills. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're going to find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. We've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray Pump Organ Collection. We're a little bit place with a great big story and we'd love to have you.
Welcome back. We're talking about the GAR and its legacy. And of course, one of the things that happened when the GAR ceased to exist because all those veterans had passed away, the Sons of Union Veterans was, was formed. And that organization is alive and well today. So those are the descendants of the Union veterans of the Civil War. And we have a lot of friends in those groups as well. And I have to mention our friend Roy Lafferty, who calls himself an SOB, which would be the son of both the Union and Confederate veterans of the Civil War. So here's a shout out to all the SOBs out there. You know, Deb, in, in my family, uh, being from Michigan, um, I have two ancestors. Um, they are my Ramsdale ancestors, and both were in the 6th Michigan Cavalry with none other than George Armstrong Custer. And my ancestor Solomon Ramsdale was actually taken uh, captive at Trevelyan Station and spent the rest of his uh, time during the war sent between Libby, Andersonville and Florence prisons until he was swapped in a prisoner exchange. And when he returned to Michigan, one of the first things he did, of course, after picking his life back up was uh, found uh, and joined the nearest GAR post because those were some of the only individuals he could talk about his wartime experiences with, especially the hell that he went through as a prisoner of war. And so the organization had such, I think it played a vital role in helping these men make that transition from wartime to civilian life. I think the role that it played socially and emotionally can't be understated. I mentioned before that President Taft was uh, in Topeka to lay the cornerstone for Memorial Hall in 1911. I think it was finished in 1914. And when it was dedicated, the crowds were estimated at 10 to 15,000 people in the streets of Topeka for the dedication. And many of those were veterans. So it was um, an incredibly important, like you said, an incredibly important camaraderie. And I mentioned before, I've got to throw this one in. Um, Charles Curtis's dad was a, a veteran and belonged to the GAR. When Charles Curtis was a young attorney, he actually prosecuted Boston Corbett, the man who shot the man who shot Lincoln. And Corbett was um, not well. He uh, had been a hatter. He maybe had mercury poisoning, but, but he just, he was not all there. But when this came to trial, he had actually gotten a job in the um, state house and he may have fired shots, he may have just held a gun, he may have waved his knife, it's according to which report, but obviously he was arrested and tried. So when they this came to trial, when I looked through the newspaper accounts, I was really expecting to find um, a lot of ridicule. Now the headlines did say Crazy Corbett is on trial, but when you read the details of the trial, there was so much sympathy for him among the veterans yes. who were likely dealing with their own PTSD. He had been a prisoner at Andersonville. Mm -hmm. um, he had, so he really had the sympathy of many of these veterans. Yeah. He later will escape from the state house, I mean, from the state hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and when he escaped from the state hospital, he headed south toward um, what will become Oklahoma. He stopped to see friends of his who were veterans who took him in and he actually returned the pony he had stolen to escape and told them to take it back for him. But that even among people who were misfits like poor Boston Corbett, mm -hmm. there was a tremendous amount of, of sympathy and, and camaraderie. Yeah, it, it gave him really, it gave him a sense of home. I mean, it, it, we could talk about Boston Corbett. You and I could talk about Boston Corbett for hours. Never. I mean, and you're right. I mean, he was a, he was an, an, he was an Englishman. He was a hatter, may have had mercury poisoning, but he had lost his wife and his child. They had died mm -hmm. before the war. 
And from the time his wife and child died, he then underwent a religious or spiritual kind of conversion and, and um, experience. And yeah, I mean, he really thought after he um, ended up killing John Wilkes Booth that he would be lauded as a hero. He never expected to be uh, court-martialed for that and tried for it. And what's interesting, even when he's being tried for that, um, again, it's, it's the veterans of the war. They're very sympathetic to him and come out in support of him. And that's what is interesting about the GAR. Um, at, in Fort Scott, we have an interesting case. Um, during the war uh, in a Michigan unit, the 3rd Michigan Infantry, there was a young uh, infantry trooper named Private Franklin Thompson, who mm -hmm. was originally from Canada. Uh, but what Private Franklin Thompson hid from his unit mates during the course of the war is that his name was really Sarah Emma Edmonds. And after the war, she married a gentleman also from Canada named Linus Seeley, and she became Sarah Seeley. After the war, Sarah Seeley and her husband moved to Fort Scott, and they lived just a little bit outside of town. And she's known as kind of this oddity. Uh, she preferred to wear pants. She preferred to, at times, ride her horse astride and not necessarily side saddle all the time. She was known to be a good shot hunting. Um, but one of the things Sarah Seeley had was a connection to local veterans. And she worked to try to raise funds to set up a veterans home in Fort Scott. Her health, which was poor due to her wartime experience, her injuries and untreated malaria and other issues, led her to eventually resettle in Texas but she is the only woman buried with full GAR honors. And she was buried in her GAR uniform, wearing her medals. And it was members of various GAR posts that she wrote to who helped her get the label of deserter taken off her military record and helped get her pension. Isn't that an incredible story? That's... Just one of those, again, as I often say, you can't make this up and you really can't make that one up. No. Just an incredible story. And I've, I've been humbled because I've had the opportunity to portray her, uh, to portray her at that time in her life when she was in Fort Scott. And I find it kind of almost, it's almost like kismet because she moved from Canada to Michigan and I'm from Michigan. And she moves to Fort Scott and I moved from Michigan to Kansas and end up in Fort Scott. So I thought, wow, that's a, to me, that's the universe tapping me on the shoulder. Yeah. Saying, Michelle, you need, you need to portray this woman. And yeah, she, awesome. she's interesting. And like I say, had it not been for her relationship with her unit mates and individuals in GAR posts in different parts of the country, she would not have gotten her pension. That's, that's really a, an amazing story. You know, I spent um, a couple of weeks ago when I was in Philadelphia, um, Dr. Andy Waske and I spent the day going through records at the GAR Museum in Philadelphia. And I actually did a Zoom presentation for them a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, the GAR records, I think they must have those I think maybe for the whole state, I'm not sure, but it was just fascinating. You know, a day doesn't even begin to do it, but um, they were fascinating records and from all over the place. And of course, there we found a box of GAR ribbons and they were from different um, encampments. You know, the GAR would have reunions or encampments, um, I guess, annually. In, in different cities. And often the railroad would give them free passage to go to those encampments. So we found a bunch of those um, encampment ribbons and then we found a bunch of the membership ribbons and, and there's all kinds of just cool stuff. They would bring mementos that were then donated to the museum and exchange things like that. And yeah, it was really a neat, neat experience. 
Now you make me want to go out and start searching for GAR records related to my, my two Ramsdell ancestors. When I'm back home in Michigan in June, I may have to, I may have to make a little trip and do a little digging. Um, now, now I'm curious. You've piqued my curiosity. Well, of course, most of my um, ancestors were on the Confederate side. Uh, my great-grandfather was at Gettysburg, captured at, at Culp's Hill, and spent the rest of the war at Point Lookout at a Confederate prison. And ironically, um, you know, in that small world deal, at Fort Wallace, our surgeon, Dr. Turner, um, started pretty close to started his service in the Union Army. He had maybe one other small duty station, but he was at Point Lookout as a staff doctor. Wow. At the same time, my ancestor was there in the prison. So it's possible, you know, that they even would have seen each other, which is just incredible. Yeah. Well, and my Ramsdell ancestor, Solomon, was at Andersonville the same time as that Boston Corbett was there. So, you know, we hear these names, Boston Corbett, we hear Captain Turner, we, we hear all these names that are in the pages of our history books. And then as we research our own families, we find these connections and it really yeah. shows you how interconnected we all really are and how important our history is. And so that's why we love to discover history every Monday with all of you. And we hope you enjoy it as much as we do. We sure do. So we'll sign off today. If you've got some history you would like us to explore, let us know and we will sure look into it. Thanks for joining us. I'm Deb Goodrich. And I'm Michelle Martin. And we shall see you somewhere around Kansas. Kansas. Bye-bye. to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. In 1821, a trade route was opened from Missouri in the United States across prairies and mountains to Mexico. In 2021, we will mark 200 years of epic conflicts and grand adventures, larger than life personalities and sweeping landscapes. Join us on an historic journey. The Santa Fe Trail lives on. Find us on social media or santafetrail.org.